it's a real pleasure to talk about some of the work we've, we're doing in my beautiful sunlit laboratory at the uh, MGH Martino Center. For those of you who don't know, the Martino Center is kind of an interesting uh, uh, special place. It is MIT, Harvard, and MGH's advanced bioimaging laboratory. It was founded um, from a gift from the uh, Martino's family in, in memory of their daughter. And we mostly focus on MRI imaging tools, but we also have very strong nuclear medicine and optical imaging programs. Um, and so, uh, and the, the, uh, we are in Charlestown, Massachusetts, which is part of Boston. Uh, my lab used to be part of the timber shed. So the, the Martino Center is part of the, the Navy Yard in, in Charlestown, which is where shipbuilding activities centered in the, in the country for about 200 years. Uh, and uh, in fact, Old Ironsides, the uh, USS Constitution, is, is right down the road from my lab. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I'm a founder and scientific advisory board member of these two companies, and we do uh, receive some sponsored research from GE. So I run a, an MRI physics lab, um, and we're kind of unusual even in the soft money environment of the Martino Center, where, where as long as it's, it's funded, you can work on it. Um, and one way to see that is from the sort of range of, of things that we're funded by. Typically, the NIH is, sponsors most of my colleagues' work, and, and as well as ours. But we also get money from the Army, ARPA, DARPA, NSF. And, and this is kind of a list of things that we work on. Uh, how many minutes do I have? No, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, some people who know me from the old days, like in the 90s, know me as, a, as an atomic physicist who really focused on hyperpolarization. That is transferring angular momentum from places you have it, like photon fields, into places you want it, like long-lived nuclear spins. Um, and we still do work on, on those kinds of things. But in the last 10 years, um, my group has really become known for ultra-low field MRI systems. And these are what we call purpose-built. These are inexpensive devices that are designed to complement traditional high-field imaging systems. So I'll talk about that really as a way to motivate um, what a lot of people, I think, in this audience are interested in, which is uh, the advanced compute methods for image reconstruction, really focusing on work we published last year in Nature on using uh, domain transform manifold learning, a, a technique called AutoMap. Um, looking at the, at the list of the faculty I was going to be talking to here, I see people have very, very wide ranges of interest, and so I did want to include some hardware and some tool development. This is really kind of a quick overview on, like I said, sort of three things we do in my lab, and I'm happy to talk in more detail uh, later or, or just interrupt me. So ultra-low field MRI is kind of a strange thing. It, it's like, why would anybody do ultra-low field MRI? Because we know that MRI, of course, is the undisputed uh, standard of care for uh, non-invasive diagnostic imaging, particularly in the neuro system. And these machines, of course, are very expensive and very heavy. Uh, they require liquid cryogens. And, and maybe most interestingly is that they also require dedicated rooms, right? They require dedicated rooms in their hospital radiology suite because, well, they operate at high magnetic fields. And if you, for instance, are interested in bringing MRI technology to, say, the battlefield, and you notice I had been funded by the Army, um, if someone has uh, undetected shrapnel and they go in the presence of a high field magnet, they'll likely get quite hurt. And so the question really um, is, is it possible to do MRI in this low field regime to solve a particular problem, right? To solve the problem of breaking the MRI scanner outside of its controlled access environment. Lowering cost is very, very interesting, right? And that's an important, that's an important part of this work as well. But the focus has always been, can you use MRI? Can you use this incredible physics success story um, to do other things, like take it out of the hospital. So this is a scanner we built in my laboratory back in 2004. Um, it cost around 200K at the time to build it. Um, it has a biplanar electromagnet. This makes an eighth order magnetic field. So there are two coils per side. Very, very homogeneous uh, transverse uh, magnetic field. And like every good MRI scanner, it also has linear gradients. Uh, very weak, but very linear, around one millitesla per meter. Um, it is around 200K to build it. It's not as cheap as some of the magnets I saw the last time I was in New York City on Canal Street, but it really does sort of give you an idea that um, it is possible to sort of democratize uh, healthcare, uh, at least if technology like this works. So 
you know, you can't just turn the magnetic field down with MRI and expect it to work. And that's because we use inductive detection, as we all know, to detect the very, very small thermal Boltzmann polarization of nuclear spins. And nuclear magnetic moments are very small. This is what Richard Ernst refers to as the power of evil in NMR. And so unless you want to cool the subject down, uh, the only way you can make images like this, which you see at high field, uh, in time spans of you know, reasonable acquisition times, is to make the magnetic field quite large. It's, it's really quite simple. And so these scanners typically operate at one and a half and increasingly three Tesla. Um, the, the problem is actually much worse than it would seem at first glance. How does the signal to noise ratio of the inductively detected NMR experiment depend on magnetic field strength? Well, we know that the voltage in the coil is just dB dt. You, you learned this when you were like three years old, right? So that goes like B squared. Um, but the noise in the coil, um, it's Johnson noise dominated. This is actually very unusual compared to the way people do things at high magnetic field. Just actually a show of hands, who uh, does MRI physics in this room at all? OK, so there's a half a hand over there? Or is that just a? OK, so that's fine. So, so it's, worth, it's worth spending just a few moments about this. Um, but that's fine. That means you, no one in this room would be surprised if I say we're Johnson noise dominated. At high frequency, or high field, remember the magnetic field is related to the, excuse me, the spin precession frequency is related to the magnetic field by the gamma, the gyromagnetic ratio. So at three Tesla, you're operating around 100 megahertz. Okay. In those high frequency regimes, actually, you are body noise dominated. That is, the, the noise, the, the noise currents in the body, which is mostly ionic solutions, dominate the noise. But at low frequency or low field, uh, we're dominated by Johnson noise. And so we all know this relationship, of course. It's, it goes, the Johnson noise goes like root R per, per unit bandwidth, and R goes like omega for a tuned coil. So the signal to noise goes like B to the 3 halves. B to the 3 halves is kind of awful, right, if you're trying to do things at low field. So the question is, what sort of images would you expect to be able to make at low field, roughly 500 times lower magnetic field, roughly 10,000 times lower signal to noise? You'd probably expect you could make images like this, which are not very impressive, and, and you'd be right. These were images we acquired of my then student, Leo Tsai. This is his head. It's a little hard to tell, two views of his head, right? They took about an hour to acquire. Um, nobody was particularly impressed, well, no one in this room is particularly impressed by these images, uh, but we were ecstatic, actually, because we built this machine not to do proton imaging, not to do standard imaging, but to do hyperpolarized gas imaging in which we use optical pumping spin exchange to spin polarize helium-3 nuclear spins, so you get a magnetic gas, which you then inhale, and you have huge signal, right? Polarization is of order unity, so you get a boost of around 10 to the 7 in polarization, and then you can image beautiful high-resolution images of human lungs. In this case, we're just using the wimpy thermal Boltzmann polarization, and no one was very impressed. And the Army wouldn't be very impressed with this either. So, so what I want to talk about really is how to solve this problem, right? It's critical if someone is interested in doing MRI and leveraging all the interesting soft tissue contrasts and things that come from the kind of images you can make with NMR-based detection, um, it's critical that you be able to find solutions to operate at low magnetic field if you want to take this out of the controlled access environment. And there's sort of two parts to this talk. The first is based around physics, which is how could we maximize the signal to noise of the signal that's going into our preamps, okay? And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the way we sample, what's called in the MRI parlance a pulse sequence. And I'll very briefly talk about these low noise, Johnson noise uh, inductive detectors. And then for the second part, I, I want to sort of talk about, okay, once you've acquired the signal, how can you then just remove noise or fix it in post, as kids like to say. And, and I'll briefly touch on magnetic resonance fingerprinting, which is a really beautiful model-based way of reconstructing data, and then I'll spend some time on, on uh, something uh, we really innovated on, which is deep learning-based reconstruction. So very, very briefly, um, because I understand that this is all, this is going to be new to all of you, except for maybe one. Um, so you know if you're Johnson noise dominated, right, you have to do signal averaging. Now, signal averaging is something we all understand. And so, you know, the signal, signal to noise does increase with the number of averages, but again, like 
not that fast, like root number of averages. So in my laboratory, if we want to make a reasonable three-dimensional image of the brain, the matrix size is, let's say, 64 by 75 by 15, okay, over a 20 centimeter field of view. So like two and a half millimeter in plane resolution. And we need to do about 30 averages. So that means you need to take around 3,400 acquisitions. So how can we take those acquisitions in a way that's going to actually get us a reasonable amount of singleton noise? And again, I apologize uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, but this is an NMR pulse sequence of a, a very standard uh, way of acquiring images, the so-called gradient echo. And so let me just show you what this, what this means in, in a cartoon. This is the application of a radio frequency pulse on the LARMA frequency. Then what we do is we phase and frequency modulate the, the, um, the NMR signal. This is the so-called uh, readout dimension or the frequency encode dimension. And then these represent I should say these solid lines represent the application of external magnetic fields known as the magnetic gradients, okay? And what these do is phase and frequency modulate the detected signal so you can then go back and encode spatial information. So the naive thing you would do would be sample all of your very, very small Boltzmann polarization and then you have to wait. You have to wait for thermal recovery. We all know that spins have a recovery time, uh, so-called T1 time, and then you repeat that experiment. Now, the good news is that at low field, this recovery time is actually shorter than at high field. It's around 150 milliseconds. So you have to wait something like five times T1. It's almost a second. And so to take this many averages takes about 40 minutes to do a, an image. Again, the motivation for this work is triage in uncontrolled environments, right? And so if it takes 40 minutes to make a kind of moderate resolution, uh, image of someone's head, no one's quite excited by this. And so let's look at an alternative approach, what's known as flash. Again, this is very MR physics heavy, I apologize. In this case, what you do is you use a very, very small tip angle, so you don't basically perturb the longitudinal polarization. And then at the end of it, uh, your shot, you spoil any transverse magnetization that remains. And so rather than having to wait for thermal recovery, you can actually go as fast as your system will let you go. In this case, it's around 25 milliseconds from shot to shot that gives you a 30-fold higher data rate. That sounds like we're going in the right direction. But you'll remember, of course, that the NMR signal, it's the sign of the tip angle, right? You're just measuring transverse magnetization. In this case, the sign of, a, of alpha is quite small, so you need even more averages to, to make back the signal you didn't get. And in this case, the total acquisition time is about the same. So there's no solution, really, to low SNR. So that's, we finished early, actually. Um, so, so actually, what we've, what we've realized is actually there are very efficient ways if you operate in a steady state where you can sample magnetization that solve this problem. And this is based around something known as balanced steady state free precession. And, and the idea is that the first half of the sequence looks like every single thing I showed you. Um, but you'll notice here there is no net gradient moment over each shot. So whatever dephasing we, we uh, invoke to do phase encoding, we then rewind it at the end. And then we drive the magnetization coherently back and forth. So rather than, rather than a pump probe experiment, to use language that, that many of you are comfortable with, we just, just drive this thing as fast as we want. Um, and then you get to a steady state value over multiple pulses of the transverse magnetization. The easiest way to see this is that's your thermal polarization. You drive it uh, with a single RF shot, and then you go back and forth, plus minus alpha, back and forth. And you get to some steady state value. And that steady state value builds up over multiple pulses. This strategy, and I'll, I'll show you uh, what it does for our imaging performance in a moment, but, but this strategy, if any of you want to leave this uh, little seminar and start doing low field MRI, this is all you need to know. These are the rules for low field MRI, and they're also good rules for life. Make the most of what you've got. So if you've got a very, very small thing that you're trying to measure, you should, you should sample all of it. Don't just sample a little bit of it. Don't waste anything, all right? We should all be, this is, this is really good lessons. Um, which means that if you have some leftover transverse magnetization that you have to destroy in order to make your measurement happen, that's not great because it is kind of taking signal away that you could otherwise acquire. And don't delay, don't wait for anything, right? Don't wait for thermal recovery if you can avoid it. Of course, Herman Carr knew this in 1958. There, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, of course, MRI imaging hadn't been invented yet, but he was trying to do nuclear magnetic resonance experiments with long T1 samples. He also had poor SNR, and so uh, he invented this approach. So we've just wrapped it in an imaging sequence. Okay, so when you run that sequence, 
Um, these are some images of a human head. Uh, this is my uh, then postdoc, Chris LaPierre. Um, and uh, the acquisition time for one of these uh, scans, which is 15 slices, took uh, six minutes. And, and I'll ask you to, to um, contrast that with this experiment. So what's changed between these two experiments? And, and I'm going to wrap this in a way that, that makes sense for what I want to talk about. We changed the software, right? The hardware is exactly the same. All we did was think about the limitations of where our noise comes from and the, and the limiting time constants in the experiment and, and come up with a different way to sample the data. And so this is, um, now it's quite a number of years old now, but this is sort of the best uh, low field MRI that people can do. The results in our lab are much better than this now, but uh, in terms of a tool to allow you to say, oh, someone has a midline shift or uh, some uh, traumatic brain injury hemorrhage or, or ischemic stroke, uh, this tool would allow you to do that. Um, extremely quickly, um, so the way we detect processing spin magnetization at 300 kilohertz is, uh, is quite simple, actually. Um, and also quite new. Our magnetic field goes from ear to ear, and the traditional MRI goes this way. Um, and so we have a little volume coil. Uh, you may remember from, from grade school, if you have a sphere, a non-conducting sphere of charge, and you rotate it, the magnetic field inside is everywhere homogeneous. right? And so we took this idea, broke the sphere open so someone could put their head in there, put an Archimedean spiral uh, loop of wire, tuned and matched it, and that's how we can, can uh, detect our signal. Um, it's quite nice. This is not the inside of Chris's head. This is a, this is a structured phantom. Um, but the performance from this uh, coil is, is quite nice, actually. And this is, you know, even though this is low wavelength, kind of ham radio style stuff, this is a regime that people who develop MRI coils, which is a very rich and deep field, never really look at um, because it's just so different down at our at our uh, field lengths. Um, I should say that, that at this frequency, the wavelength is like a kilometer. And so it means you can do extremely simple things when you're tuning and matching these coils. You build a coil by putting some wires on there. You grab your 1940s decade capacitor boxes. You hook it up to your vector network analyzer. You set the dial so you're on resonance and well matched at 50 ohms. And then you solder the components in. It takes about 10 minutes. Even I can do it. So it must be quite simple. Um, so, so at this point, I just want to like, point out an interesting thing um, about the results we've obtained so far. Even though I've shown you these, albeit somewhat impressive, two and a half millimeter resolution images, um, you know, who cares, right? They're still worse than what you can do at high field. And so what, I wanna sh what I've plotted here is the transverse, mag excuse me, the steady state magnetization um, as a function of uh, magnetic field offset from the Larmor frequency. So we operated a particular magnetic field, right? But all real magnets, of course, have some inhomogeneity. And some of that inhomogeneity comes from paramagnetic, paramagnetic properties in the body. So for instance, the air tissue interface between the ventricles and the uh, gray matter, white matter, at high magnetic field cause magnetic susceptibility artifacts. At low field, since these are paramagnetic, these paramagnetic effects go away. And so as you go even you know, 15, 16 hertz off resonance, you go from having a bright signal to a dark signal. So let's look at the same subject acquired at three Tesla. So these are three views of the same subject. And you see these little artifacts, very sharp, curvy things. This is this so-called banding artifact. Okay? And this is coming from the fact that the body of this subject in the high magnetic field are causing spatial variations of magnetic field, which causes steady state value of the signal to be zero or near zero in that case. For us, you can see that there's no such banding artifact in the same region. Because for us, again, magnetic susceptibility artifacts go away. And also, what matters here is absolute homogeneity, not fractional homogeneity. So in our system, the absolute homogeneity is quite high. It's a few hertz. But the fractional homogeneity is, is much worse than in high field. Um, why this matters, again, I like to keep this thing sort of real. Um, this is, the, this is uh, some images acquired from a, a fellow who um, uh, rode his motorcycle in the rain into a tree. Uh, and uh, was sent, uh, was, was medevaced to our hospital uh, where they removed quite a bit of tree from his head. He's, a, he's still living, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, but they replaced, you know, of course some of the brain was resected, but then they replaced the space with a little plastic PMMA insert and some titanium mesh. Uh, here he is 
being imaged at high field, you can see he's missing quite a bit of brain. Here he is in our scanner, and you'll notice actually it's rare that you can uh, put someone in your scanner and say, you know what, you, you've just got more brain than you had last week. Well, of course, this is because of magnetic susceptibility artifact, right? This titanium implant, it is not ferromagnetic, but it is in fact paramagnetic, and it causes magnetic susceptibility artifact so that at high field it presents with dark signal, okay? Why this matters? It's very interesting. Suppose you had a patient who underwent surgical resection and crani cranioplasty and had a post-surgical bleed let's say in this area, you couldn't see it. But at low field, you actually could see it and you might be able to have an intervention. So again, I, I just kind of want you to, to think about the fact that these tools, based on MRI, even if the resolution isn't the top, they're still very valuable in certain cases. In this case, immunity to things like uh, paramagnetic susceptibility artifact. Uh, okay, so... <coughs> If you compare images acquired in our scanner with the kinds of images you acquire at high field, you can acquire images you know, with T2 contrast or different kinds of soft tissue contrast. Um, our images actually kind of look more like the kind of uh, images you get when you do what's called a proton density image. Okay, just the density of tissue, kind of the naive thing you would expect. Clinically, these are not that useful. These other kinds of relaxation-based contrast, magnetic relaxation contrast, so-called T1 and T2, are much more useful. Um, however, our acquisition strategy gives us signal that looks like the ratio of T2 over T1, which is actually around unity for us. So this is really a problem, um, which is a darn shame because if you look at this uh, magnet, the longitudinal relaxation uh, parameter T1 as a function of field strength, you get much more T1 dispersion at lower magnetic field. And we have no way of probing, probing that. So here's where we're going to kind of transition into talking about how we can improve acquisitions with compute. What I've done as a way to solve poor SNR is the most naive thing we would have all done, which is come up with a high data rate sequence to enable fast averaging, and then add all those images up to make a picture. Right? There are other ways you can take that same data and process it. And these are based broadly around what I would call pattern matching or curve fitting, but let's say, let's call it pattern matching. Curve fitting is an example of that, right? We're all familiar with this. So the circles here are some time dependent data. In this case, it's CPMG T2 relaxation, where you have some theory of line shape, right? It's noisy data. You have some theory of line shape. You fit your model uh, of how that data depends on some parameter like time, and it gives you quantitative information from the fit, but actually another way to think of this is that, oh, it's denoised the data, right? That red line is the denoised version if you believe your model, and let's assume that we all believe our model. You've denoised the data. So the MRI equivalent of this, at least in one incarnation, uh, it's really, was really pioneered by Mark Griswold, who, who gave a talk uh, here with me a couple months ago on magnetic resonance fingerprinting. And, and I'll show you how this works. The idea is, rather than um, taking your data and just summing them all together to make a nice picture. Uh, don't average, actually. So this is data, what you'll see here, this is data acquired in a four compartment structured phantom at, at our scanner at ultra low field. So in this case, what we're doing is we are dithering the acquisition parameters. So here's the shot to shot time, as well as the, the excuse me, this is the tip angle and this is the shot to shot time. And, you, and we acquire a very, very noisy image with each of these sets of parameters. And we're not averaging them together, we're just keeping them. And if you look at this carefully, you see like certain things flash brighter, certain quadrants are different than other quadrants. There's some interesting thing going on here. We're not in the steady state, we're just interrogating this system essentially randomly. And then what you do is you take, uh, let's say one of these images and one particular pixel, and we look at the time trajectory of the signal in that pixel. We call that a fingerprint. Okay, it's analogous to the kind of fingerprint that you would find, if I believe what I see in the movies, on a crime scene, right? It's some noisy thing that has a lot of features and, and some of it's missing, and this is a noisy thing with a lot of features. And then going with the movie uh, analogy for a moment, uh, how does this work, right? Uh, some detective will look at that fingerprint and they will search their database of fingerprints and they reproduce the full fingerprint. 
So that's actually pretty neat, right? Because of a database of what fingerprints look like, they were able to find the match and denoise it. Additionally, they then go and they can find out who that person was. In this case, it's my colleague Chris Farrar. Right, so how do you do this with NMR? We now have a noisy fingerprint. Well, we search a database of all possible NMR trajectories with the parameters that we're varying, say T1 and T2 and proton density and things like that. We then find the best match through a dot product and we get the properties quantitatively of that pixel. Um, what I described here uses a, a traditional dot product match as, as was in Mark's original paper. Um, we published last year an approach that uses a deep learning reconstruction network to essentially invert the block equations, which I, I'm not going to talk about today. Um, the way we generate these trajectories is actually quite simple. Um, you come up with some random but smoothly varying, it doesn't have to be smoothly varying, but in this case, random but smoothly varying uh, schedule, which is the tip angle and the shot-to-shot -shot, uh, time. Then you put those things into some block equation simulator with input parameters of all possible ranges of tissues that you might find, okay? And remember, this is, we call this a database or a dictionary. This is not like a, a database of pathology. It's just a database of numbers, right? Of relaxation times that can run from, say, a millisecond to five seconds. So you're just simulating all possible. How would any possible uh, material respond to this interrogation. And so we go through a block equation simulator, <clears throat> we get an output, and then we just crank these things out. Okay. Um, the historic way that this was originally uh, envisioned, uh, like I showed you before, was use a thousand point random acquisition trajectory. Um, but actually, uh, my former postdoc, Uri, and I um, published a couple years ago an approach where we can really pare down the number of measurements you make. Again, remember, this is motivated by work that we do at low field, and if we have to take a thousand different images, it's going to take a long time. So we managed to, to narrow that down to just acquiring 20 points, so 20 tip angles and 20 uh, acquisition times. And let me just show you what it looks like. So this is a 3D fingerprinting happening in that same structured phantom I showed you before. And so you'll see a set of 3D images coming in for each tip angle and uh, shot to shot time. And you can see the contrast is actually quite different from, from each of these. And, and remember, we're not adding these all together, we're actually keeping them. And then from that, we pattern match to our database, right? And then you can generate all these other synthetic contrast images. It's quite nice, actually. So we get T1 and T2 relaxation, quantitative relaxation uh, maps as well as measurements of the magnetic field, uh, both the static magnetic field and the RF magnetic field. So this approach, and this took about 20 minutes, is really a quantitative in image contrast approach that is highly error or fault tolerant, right? So you can take noisy data, of which we have a lot of, and knowing how that data depends on your theory of line shape or whatever, however you want to think of it, um, you can recover more information. Uh, we've done this in the human head, of course, and it works quite nicely. And, and the, the beautiful part of this is it allows us to maintain our fast data rate, but still generate images um, that are clinically useful and now tease out this interesting place, please. One quick question. The, the dictionary is pre-computed. The dictionary is pre-computed. The whole number of permutations of your object space is just way too high to compute real time. So that's super interesting, actually. So, so you're, you, you are right, and the next thing you're going to say is something we've already done as well. So, so in this case, the typical magnetic resonance fingerprinting experiment varies, allows for three parameters, the relaxation, T1 and T2s, and the magnetic field offset. Let's say you want to extend this work and say, oh my god, right? If you look at the way people do MRI, there's diffusion-weighted sequences, there's chemical exchange sequences, there's all sorts of things. Could you vary every damn parameter all at once? Like turn every knob on the scanner, acquire this data, and then reconstruct it. Yes, but the dictionary would get too large to do it the way I just described. So what we do with this deep reconstruction network approach is actually just that. And so you actually only compute a very light dictionary, and you use the fact that neural networks, fully connected layers and neural networks can solve regression problems very easily. And so you can do multi-parameter MRI this way. So we do, I think, eight or nine parameter MRI, chem chemical exchange saturation transfer MRI, the same way at high field. Yeah, so this is a, this is a, 
Uh, the dot product approach is, a, is not the right way to do it, um, but it works. Right. Please. Have you seen artifacts because of that? Like when you construct your deep network, so, yeah, so you need to make sure, so you're talking about the deep, the deep network. So you have to make sure you don't uh, um, overfit. And so overfitting is always an issue when you're solving regression problems. And so, and some of that is kind of empirical, the way you kind of figure out it, you know. But it does mean when you're designing these things that you need to um, generate your, uh, your, your, your train and then test carefully outside of the training corpus, right? So, there, so we, yes, if you do things wrong, it's a problem, but actually the paper we published two years ago uh, on drone, I think two years ago, show that it's actually much more accurate than even a fine-grained dot product. Um, because the parameter space is just so darn large, and, and if you think about it, the dot product, hmm, how do I put this? The block equations are smooth in parameter space, right? But it's a complicated parameter space. It could be an eight-dimensional parameter space. If you throw away a priori that it's smooth and you just treat everything as a discrete time point, then it's very easy for the dot product to say, oh, if I have parameter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 with these values, or I have eight different values, they're so very close. It could be the same thing, even though they're, they're very far apart in, in the smoothness, right? But by training a regression to do this correctly, you actually exploit the fact that these parameters have some smooth variant, you, you generate a continuous function for the inverse, right? As opposed to just looking at a, at a similarity me metric. That's a long answer, I apologize. And I am cognizant of the time. Uh, wow. <laughs> can someone move the time back a couple minutes? Uh, but, but it works pretty well. We can talk about it more. Um, so, okay. So I've showed you that um, with the right pulse sequence, we can take good images, pretty good images. Um, we can get contrast. Um, we can make, we have good coils. What else is there to do? I mean, we sort of hit a wall in my lab. Uh, well, my postdoc Neha built a quadrature coil, um, which is just another way to get additional SNR. So now instead of looking at the one transverse component for precessing magnetization, she looks at both. So you get something like root two SNR gain on that. But that's it. We kind of run out of ideas for how to improve the SNR on the physics side. Um, and, and so the, it used to be kind of be a joke in my lab that like people would say, well, we can't improve the signal. Can we just like turn the noise down? Like, ha ha, right? That's just like a, a thing people say. A, and then so for the last part of this talk, I want to talk about um, an effort um, where my current postdoc, Bo Zhu, took this very seriously and, and wanted to see, can we actually do this? Can we just remove noise? So. This is kind of a generalized thing, at least I want to try to talk in a general way so that it's more useful for you guys and, and your own research. So, but, so let's talk about imaging in general, just to get the language clear. So imaging, you have some object, right? And then you forward encode that into some sensor, right? Let's call it a sensor domain. And so there's a representation of that object in your sensor domain. And these are medical uh, things I'm showing, but but you can pick your favorite uh, modality if you want. And that sensor domain could be radon sinogram for PET and CT. It could be element time space for ultrasound, right? Or it could even be Fourier space for Cartesian MRI. And then to go into the image, what do you do? Well, we call that reconstruction, right? And you invert the forward encoding. It's very, very simple. To put this in a more concrete terms, let's go to MRI. So an MRI, what is the forward model? Well, it's very simple. It's the signal, right? And we can write that down. 50 years ago, we could write this down, right? We use NMR inductive detection, which we all know, which I've written down here, of an object which is basically some, some spin magnetization density, modulated by phase and frequency through applied gradient fields. So I've written that down. Okay, this is the forward model for 2D Cartesian MRI. And we immediately recognize that this is actually the Fourier transform. So that's cool, right? And so then, of course, to invert it, it means we just do the inverse Fourier transform. And this is the way people have been doing MRI forever. This is the first way people did MRI. It gets more complicated if you want to do other kinds of sampling patterns, right? Like non-Cartesian sampling, such as spiral. This is a thing people do. And then 
to, that's the forward model. Again, very easy to write down the forward model. You just say the signal at this particular combination of parameters is equal to the source magnetization times whatever your encoding function is. But to invert it, it's a little harder, right? Some of these things require regridding, non-uniform Fourier transforms, etc. Then, contemporary MRI uses multi-channel MRI, and so then you need to do all sorts of often non-linear optimization and often uh, iterative reconstruction approaches with some regularizers to actually be able to solve the inverse problem. And in fact, as you do more and more things like add undersampling, you're really doing conjugate gradient optimizations and other kind of transforms where you don't really know the inverse, but you have, an, you have a way to minimize something in the, in, in the regularization process. So, what you have here, if we color code each of these steps as different colors, is a kind of a bit of a mess, right? Where you have whatever your choice of sensor is, and you'll notice I put in like radio astronomy and whatever kind of domains you're interested in, and you have this, this ad hoc thing where each of these modules is someone's career, right? And you take your data, you regret it, you do the, oh, okay, I, I've come up with a new regularizer, hooray for me, I published that in some IEEE journal, right? All of these things, it's complicated. And it's all ad hoc. This reminds me, maybe it reminds you, of the way speech recognition was a few years ago, right? Where people would do what was called expert feature extraction. And so how would this work? You would have some utterance, you'd Fourier transform it, you would then like try to do, you try to hand code methods to, to represent vowels and consonants and phonemes. You'd read like all this Noam Chomsky stuff about theories of language. Right? Someone would have a Yankee accent and you'd say, oh, they have this Yankee accent, we have to figure out a way hard-coded to understand how it works. And then when you test it on someone with a, say, southern drawl, the whole thing fails. We're all familiar with the way speech recognition used to be. How do we solve this problem now? We use, of course, supervised learning. Right? Incredibly simple. So you get four people saying four different things, as an example. Different people. Right? You put it into this big piece of linear algebra with all of these degrees of freedom, and then you look at the output. And the output you compare, in this case, to the input, and it's wrong. So you use, what, backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, to update all of these millions of network weights. And you do this if you define your training corpus right and you don't overfit, and you inject noise in the right way to try to promote manifold learning, you get something that works quite well. In this case, remember, we haven't put in any external theory of language. All we needed was the ground truth. So we have the data in two domains, and we let the network define its own, we let the data, and I apologize for this sort of anthropomorphism, but the data defines its own internal representation. The network, through training, develops a sparse way to represent this highly dimensional, high dimensional data and give you what you want. And this is how Siri and all these things works, right? So, Broadly speaking, automated feature extraction has now solved lots of interesting problems. All of these you, you've probably seen before. And it's really because of three things, right? It's certainly true that all the work that was done in the 70s and 80s around deep and convolutional neural networks is now coming, you know, ripe. Um, big data, uh, the fact that you can get labeled data, okay, because I, I showed in that case of supervised, supervised data where you need the ground truth in, in two domains. So what we call big data, and also the fact that so many people play video games, you could do matrix multiplication thanks to NVIDIA on all of these things. Okay, that's supervised learning, which is a form of machine learning. I wanna talk about a different kind of learning, which is based in biology, and it's what we call perceptual learning. And this is how biological systems, including humans, learn to see. Okay, so we're born blind, and what happens over the early, year, the early days, hours, days, weeks, years of development is that the representation in our visual cortex changes um, based on exposure and training to stimuli. Our eyes are not really pixel sensors. Well, they are, but that's not the way it gets represented here. Your brain learns these sparse convolutional features of the data that you're looking at and determines, again, through experience, what is important. So for instance, out here in the side of my peripheral vision, I don't see pixel, 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 but my brain says there's an edge, there's a pattern, and there's a texture, right? And you're familiar with this, even if you don't realize it, 
because this so-called perceptual learning is critical to robust performance in low SNR settings. And you might say, like, what? This is crap, right? Like, we can't see in the dark very well. I don't know what you're talking about. But, but actually, it's true. If you took your cell phone camera, right, turn the lights down a little bit, and we took an image in this room, and then looked at it, you would have what? You'd have a grainy image. But even me, with my terrible eyes, I don't see you guys as grainy. So it's kind of interesting. There's sort of some fundamental denoising that's happening from the brain, from the, what we call the mind's eye, or through this perceptual learning process. And, and, you know, just before someone raises their hand and says, well, the retina is way more efficient than CMOS sensors, that's totally not true, right? Even the cheapest CMOS sensor is like five times higher quantum efficiency. And so another example of the fact that the, f that the fact that your brain identifies features from noisy inputs and hallucinates the final image in your mind, um, here's an example of that. So what animal is this? Quick, right? It's a dog, right? So that's interesting because you all knew that and I violated Nyquist theorem by showing you like less than half the data. And you knew this because you've seen many examples of dogs in your life, maybe not that dog in particular. And now to sort of switch and connect this uh, neuroscience to signal processing, you took an undersampled or low SNR uh, image and you reconstructed it or hallucinated it to a fully sampled image. Now, what if you try doing the same thing with MRI, right? So this is the signal chain in MRI, very, very simple, right? If we then want to go faster and take less data and then reconstruct it, you get some like C minus grade image. It looks terrible. Why is this so much worse? Why can't our digital reconstruction approaches hallucinate and do a good job with undersampled data? And so that's really the question, and this is really the approach for, for work we've done uh, with perceptual learning for MRI and, and for solving inverse problems in general. So we've basically paralleled this formalism where you have your, your noisy visual inputs through some neuronal spiking, which then you reconstruct through this lifelong data-driven trading process known as perceptual learning, uh, analogously to noisy data coming in, your preamp from, let's say, Fourier case space acquisitions and reconstructed and using this approach. And we call this AutoMap. Uh, this is a work, again, really um, uh, led by my postdoc, Bo Zhu. Um, automated transform by manifold approximation. And the idea is that we remove all of these people's jobs, sorry, all of these colored boxes <laughs> with, with one formalism that can actually learn the correct way to reconstruct domain transform uh, as a supervised learning task. And, and it actually uses two forms of learning, as I talked about. One is this data-driven training supervised learning to remove these handcrafted pipelines just to make people's lives easier, right? If your student comes to you and says, I have a new way to acquire data or sample data, then you can say, great, have you come up with the inverse can you solve the inverse problem? And they go away for like three years and maybe they never come back, right? So a tool like this would actually allow you to be more creative about the way you sample things. And we are uh, cognizant of the perceptual learning archetype um, to improve the SNR of noisy data. Topologically, you can sort of think of this as the training process um, conditions uh, a joint manifold, one domain which consists of, let's say, images, and one domain which is in the sensor domain. And training, and I'll, I'll go into this in more detail, training conditions both of these manifolds to be maximally sparse in their appropriate domain, and then it also learns the relationship between them by example. Okay, and, and actually, you'll notice there's pictures of cats and dogs here. All of this work was done conditioning and training the model on images from Google even though I'm going to show you the reconstructions of brain images, the properties of natural images are what matters. It doesn't have to be so much in domain. Okay, this is not something that many of you are probably familiar with, such as a convolutional uh, neural network denoiser. Uh, this is work from Jaco Lentinen, a, a paper that's called Noise to Noise. In this case, you, you train your network on pairs of examples where you have some noisy image and you give it the clean image. Now, this noisy image might be uh, Poisson noise corrupted, it might, be, it might be Johnson noise corrupted, whatever it is, uh, Ricean noise corrupted, and you learn a mapping to denoise. That's not what this is. What we do is we train on clean 
pairs of data that are generated from the forward encoding model. So remember what I talked about the way we do imaging. You have your object and then you forward encode it into the sensor domain. And then the hard part is the inverting, right? So the way we train this is we, we take lots of images, natural images, we will forward encode them into the sensor domain and then we will use that for the training process which I'll show you shortly. The training process, again, to reiterate this because it's sort of new, identifies sparsity in both of these domains and then learns to invert the encoding. And the noise immunity that I will show you develops naturally because it operates between sparse manifolds, just like uh, perceptual learning. Okay, I said sparsity about 30 times in the last 15 seconds. So I want to just uh, emphasize what I mean by sparsity. There are many definitions of sparsity. I like to think of it sort of as um, higher dimensional data or high dimensional data can be re represented with less coefficients in a sparse domain, right? So here's a toy problem. Here's a picture of some circles. And so let's look at that blue circle in particular. In pixel space, right, you write down the pixel value of every uh, blue uh, shaded area. In circle space, to make up a toy model, you can specify this with a triplet of numbers. So we could say that circle space is a sparse domain for circles, right? That's what I mean by sparsity. Okay, noise, on the other hand, can be anything, right, except sparse. The number of possible images in this 128 by 128 image is a number with like 5,000 digits, right, two to the 128 squared, okay? And if you look at this long enough, like I guess you'll see a picture of a dog. It's possible, but it's gonna take a long time. And so what we're trying to understand is the fundamental difference between noise and things that are image-like, have image-like properties. So since noise can be anything, it's very unlikely to be able to identify any domain in which it can be represented with less coefficients because anything is possible, right? So here's image domain. Here's a Fourier transform of noise. It, it's still, you know, not sparse. And even a, a domain that people are very familiar with from, say, JPEG compression, the wavelet domain, it's also not sparse, right? So that's, that's no surprise. But images are different, right? Natural images are special. And I'll show you. Well, here's a natural image. It's not sparse in pixel domain, right? Except for the fact that the field of view is slightly too large. You still need to go to every single point and write down the pixel intensity. So, so natural images aren't sparse in, in that domain. How about in the Fourier domain? That's got to be it. Uh, well, no. It's not sparse in the Fourier domain either, right? That's not surprising because we know that one point in image domain gets mapped to all points in the Fourier domain. That's, that's unfortunate. So what about this whole story I told you? I, I showed some references. I said, like, the brain identifies sparse convolutional features in the visual cortex, and what, what, what are you talking about? Well, there are domains in which images are sparse. The wavelet domain is one example, right? So we're all familiar with this, where most of these coefficients are zero. That's how image compression works. So images do have this property that there is a domain or multiple domains in which you can represent it sparsely. The connection between all this stuff that I said before and neural networks, synthetic neural networks, is the following. Neural network training encourages, if you do it right, again, this is to your point, an efficient internal representation of the mapping between domains. And an, and an efficient internal representation is the same thing as having less coefficients. And so neural network training, if you do it right, can identify sparsity. Okay, since I'm pressed for time, I'm going to push through this. So finally, here's the network that we use for Automap. For those of you who work in this field, this is incredibly simple. This is like baby food stuff, right? We have a fully connected uh, layer here, and we have two convolutional autoencoders on the output, and it works just fine. It works fine because what we learn is the mathematical transform and conditioned on the fact that we're going to take advantage of sparse properties <coughs> of natural images. So you put in your sensor, once trained, you put in your sensor domain signal here, you get your output image here. And it's a fully feed forward network. So let's show how we train it. This is actually quite interesting. Um, 
I'll try to cover it very quickly. As a physicist, I like math problems. I don't like linear algebra systems that have a bazillion degrees of freedom, right? And so when we put this together, um, we built the architecture of the network, even though, of course, the weights are still trained using uh, gradient descent. Um, we still wanted to make sure that the formalism was there so that we could, we could use the fact that we understand mathematics a little bit. Um, and if you read our paper in the supplement, actually, uh, my student Jeremiah Liu worked out, he's a mathematician, and he worked out in great detail how actually what we're doing, this manifold mapping, uh, can be explicitly proven. So it's, it's worth looking at. But the short of it is that the fully connected network uh, input layer takes advantage of, of a well-known theorem called the universal function approximator, which says that any function can be, th this can represent any function using a finite number of nodes on a compact set. And then the output layers are just very, very simple. Everyone is, is familiar with those. These are just a convolutional uh, autoencoder. And we actually, in the training, force the uh, reconstruction to have sparse convolutional features on the output feature map. Actually, just as an aside, once this network is trained, if you interrogate the sparse convolutional features, they look like this. I don't know if these uh, mean anything to you guys. These look like kind of edge detectors, you know, no surprise. They're also identical or basically identical to the visual, the receptive fields of our visual cortex, the so-called Gabor filters. No surprise, because we're, we're uh, imposing an L1 norm penalty. But it's interesting to see these things evolve organically. Uh, OK, so the way we train this is on the forward model. So we went to ImageNet. We got all these images of cats and dogs. We forward encode it into the sensor domain representation that we want to uh, reconstruct. We um, corrupt this data through a process known as dropout or multiplicative noise multiplication to promote manifold learning. And then we input that into AutoMap like this. And then the network comes out with some output, and we compare that output to the known input through a loss function, which is basically the root mean square error, and also this L1 norm penalty on the output layer. And we do this in mini batches of like 30 or so. And we let this thing train up. OK, so here's how we learn the inverse Fourier transform. Um, the training corpus in this case are uh, cats and dogs and birds and tigers. Uh, that's one of the images from the, from the uh, training corpus, forward encoded. And once trained, we now are going to give this network something it hasn't seen before, this case space. What is this case space? Well, the inverse Fourier transform it is just this flower. And so, lo and behold, AutoMap could reconstruct it. Who cares? Again, who cares? Um, well, it's quite interesting, actually, right? This network learned to do a double integral, well, in this case, a double discrete sum, um, by example, right? It was trained only on the forward model. It was trained on this data, exactly this pairs of data. That's the USS Constitution, by the way. Um, and so that's kind of remarkable, actually, that it somehow learned to invert by example. Why this is interesting, actually, well, you can give it a brain. It's never seen a brain before. It also will reconstruct a brain. Why this is interesting is because, it, as I said earlier, it opens the space for learning arbitrary encoding schemes. Looking at the time, it's clear I'm going to go over. I don't know what everyone else has planned for their day. I'll keep talking until someone tells me to shut up. How long do you have? I would say we could probably get through it in 10 minutes. I'll do my best. Yeah, sorry. I, I, that 10 minutes at the beginning kind of, kind of fooled me. Um, so, uh, so I showed you this slide early on. And so what I'm going to just quickly talk about for the rest of this talk is this part of the reconstruction process. Um, but actually, there's all sorts of interesting stuff. I was talking with Matt earlier on about this, which is that you can actually start interrogating, are there better ways to do the acquisition? And we've actually done this work in my laboratory with a reinforcement learning approach where you have an AI agent that plays a, a, a synthetic scanner and comes up with interesting uh, acquisition strategies or using a computational graph formalism. And I won't be able to talk about any of that stuff right now, uh, which is too bad. Uh, OK, so let's test AutoMap. Finally, we're going to get to a useful thing. So let's take some data. Let's noise corrupt it to give it some finite SNR and compare how the trained network, remember this network is trained on clean data, now we're going to give it data that actually has finite SNR. Let's see how it compares to the ground truth. 
And so we'll just pick a particular example from the world of MRI, it's kind of a tricky one, spiral MR, and we're going to compare it to, uh, uh, we add 25 dB Gaussian noise and we compare it to a reconstruction with a non-uniform Fourier transform iterative reconstruction and you get a thing like this. So a noiseless reference, 25 dB SNR reconstructed using typical ground truth, excuse me, typical uh, workflow uh, approaches. You get a root mean square error compared to the ground truth of about five, single to noise of around 14. If we put this in auto map, what do we see? We see an improvement in SNR by about a factor of three and a similar reduction in error. We could spend a lot of time on this slide, but I'd rather show you this. Whatever, whatever forward model we train the network on, in all cases, Here's the noiseless reference. Automap outperforms the conventional reconstruction by something like factors of two or three in SNR and corresponding reduction in error. This is actually uh, gets even better as the data gets noisier. So here's some really noisy data. Again, ground truth and then noise added to make the reconstruction uh, have a SNR of around five. Uh, Automap again outperforms in two, again, these are two different uh, forward encoding models. And I will point out that, you know, the way typically people reconstruct radon data is iterative. And so these are feed-forward approaches, outperforming, iterative reconstruction, regularized, highly handcrafted, this is an MBIR, right? Highly handcrafted iterative reconstruction that people have spent their careers working on. <clears throat> so we started talking about low-field MRI, we're back to low-field MRI. Um, this is a, that phantom you were familiar with before, my postdoc Neha did a whole bunch of signal averaging to get really high SNR. Automap versus the conventional reconstruction, they look about the same. But as we take less and less data moving to the left, you can see that this image with only 40 averages is significantly worse than the automap reconstruction of the same data set. This is a plot of the ratio of SNR. Uh, and so as you get to noisier and noisier data, you get a boost from automap because remember, the transform was conditioned on the fact that we're trying to reconstruct natural images which have natural sparse properties. Uh, this is also true for uh, brain data. Um, very interestingly, uh, this is a funny project that I'm involved with through the Department of Energy and some collaborators at Texas A&M where we are actually in the field, literally in the field at College Station uh, and we've put an MRI scanner um, down in the ground to look at plant roots as they grow and you can also reconstruct that data as well and you see similar boosts. Um, what I want to, and I think I just have enough time to do it, what I want to um, impart on you is why we get this SNR boost. And it's tricky. As I said, you know, there's all these degrees of freedom and, and there are not that many tools for sort of understanding exactly what's going on in this approach, but there are some. So let's look at the activation of this first hidden layer. In this case, I've trained the network on ImageNet, cats and dogs and birds and flowers. And I've given it the case space of a brain, okay, which was outside of its training corpus. And we're gonna look at the activation of this layer. Okay, it looks like this. Keep that in your mind. It doesn't mean anything on its own. And when we reconstruct that brain, we get an SNR of around 27. Now, we could have trained the network on white Gaussian noise and the Fourier transform of white Gaussian noise, right? Those are related. I claim that this network is learning to do a transform conditioned on the forward model. So we could do that. And in fact, when we train the network that way and then give it an image, or excuse me, the case space of a brain, it transforms it. The SNR is quite reduced compared to the network trained on natural images, and the activation of that layer is much higher, okay? So the whole story I told you earlier on about efficient representation through training, right? This is not very efficient compared to this. This is efficient because the network is conditioned on the fact that natural images have certain sparse features. And then of course, if you decide to train the network on brains, and their forward encoding, which is more domain specific, right? Then you get even more sparse activation in the reconstruction and a slightly higher performance. Uh, another way to look at this is to use a T-SNE. This is a very unusual use of the T-SNE, but what this is is a plot of the relationship between the network weights to the input. 
And if you train the network on just noise and the forward uh, model of noise, the network doesn't respect any spatial uh, uh, connections in the data, right? It's just like a, a mathematical Fourier transform. Each data point is independent. But as you get more and more domain specific, you learn relationships between the source data. This figure should remind you a little bit about our manifold learning thing. Uh, I think I need to sort of wrap up. Uh, yes. Whew. <clears throat> so uh, what I hopefully convey to you guys is a couple different things, right? One is that, you know, just because it's like my first love or my second love or third love, MRI is possible outside the scanner suite through this combination of physics and compute. Um, and, and, you know, our newest member of the family is this automap formalism, which now gets its own slide. Um, and what automap has really showed us is that it's a unified reconstruction approach, um, which takes advantage of properties of sparse data automatically. So you don't have to a priori say, let's operate in the wavelet domain like compressed sensing. Uh, and you can automatically learn optimal reconstruction for arbitrary encodings. And it changes the game for us because it is so immune to noise. And that means that, as I said, we were doing all this signal averaging so you can get faster scan times with less signal averaging. There are many, many, many other medical imaging or other imaging paradigms that are noise limited. Uh, and so you can, for instance, do uh, X-ray CT with less dose if you want, if you can find a way to boost the SNR. And again, this rapid reconstruction, feed forward one millisecond reconstruction compared to what can be some significant fraction of a minute for some of these other approaches, meaning that you could do real-time reconstruction on the scanner. Um, I didn't talk about this uh, acquisition strategies at all. I just briefly showed it. But the idea is that you can come up with your own acquisition strategies. <laughs> Excuse me. The network can come up with its own acquisition strategies that are designed to minimize acquisition time, maximize accuracy, minimize SAR, maximize something else, right? There's all sorts of interesting things you can put in the loss function. Whew. So that's it, really. I want to acknowledge uh, my group, both members in the past and present, and thank you guys for, for uh, letting me talk over my welcome. What a memory you have, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, so to, do, to do 128 by 128 complex data, okay, like we do, that's basically 16 gig of GPU RAM. Hmm. Yeah, so that's pretty sad. And, and so, yes. Oh, yes. You're absolutely right. So that's an issue. And, and there are two approaches. So this paper has been cited, I think, as of this morning, like 240 times in the last 18 months. And the first sentence always says, Automap, wow, awesome. And the second sentence says, this thing is terrible for the reason you describe, right? And so we are working on, well, there's two approaches. One is we're that are based around the same thing. So network pruning is kind of an interesting idea, but you need to get the network in memory before you start pruning it. So what we're doing is we're currently running it on a, on a 512 gig power, IBM Power 9 uh, machine to try to see if we can learn something about pruning these networks that we can then extrapolate to, um, larger networks that we, don't, that we can grow. So we're trying to sort of develop network growing algorithms. It's one approach. Um, you could also sparsify the, the, um, the fully connected layer if you want to put some more prior information in there. And so there's several people who have published approaches. I think one is called de-automap, like deconstructed automap, um, where they say, oh, we know the data is x, y, and z. Uh, and so we could build a, the network that way. Honestly, this was built this way because our original idea was, can we build something that can work for everything? Um, and it was kind of more of a, a sort of intellectual exercise. Um, but I would say there are, there are, I mean, to your point, if you have very high dimensional data, and we're trying to actually do some of this work with like X-ray CT, where the dimensionality is huge, um, you can still take things that you've learned. You don't, you don't necessarily need to do the domain transform to, to, to um, exploit sparsity. 
all of these convolutional denoisers that everybody uses, that exploits sparsity, but just in the image domain, right? Um, and you can fit anything in those. You can do super high res stuff. But for us, we always felt, uh, and we're trying to learn the limits of this, that, that it's a darn shame to, to throw away all of the raw data, you know, like just to fit it into some memory thing. So it's not really an answer, except I'm well aware of the problem. <laughs> we are working on it. Uh, it was the subject of uh, my postdoc Bo's K award that he submitted recently, and so we're working on it. Okay, there's another quick question. Yeah, well, quick question. So, so uh, how is the sparsity related to entropy? Is it possible to, to yeah, explain right. the, <clears throat> the frameworks in terms of entropy? So that, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I feel like there are people in this room who may know, know, know that a little more. Um, so like the TSNI metric, right, which is a dimensional, dimensional reduction approach, has a connection to entropy. Um, I don't know that personally. But I think everything you're saying is correct. Um, now whether or not we could somehow use that correct statement to advise uh, us doing something differently? I'm not sure. Um, I will say that the, the slide I showed extremely briefly um, about coming up with discovering essentially pulse sequences and ways to interrogate systems through what we call proximal optimal control um, does actually operate uh, explicitly in the Fisher by minimizing Fisher information. So this is all, these things are all very closely related to uh, information theory. Uh, and there's some beautiful work by, by Naftali Tishbi, it's contentious but, but beautiful work, uh, that talks about exactly the flow of information in these systems. So. What is the significance of that? I just built a machine and I want it. So, so the, the actual significance is, is, um, is quite funny. I, try, I wanted to build a 10 millitesla scanner and then when I, I, you know, I designed it and then I needed a power supply and there was this giant old 1972 alpha power supply that couldn't go and provide that much current. So I said, oh, okay, that's fine. Sorry, so, so. Oh. Well, so if there's no magnetic field at all, there's no axis of quantization, so there is no Boltzmann polarization, so there's no observable, right? So the way conventional MRI works is, is, is you do need an axis of quantization. Now, that axis of quantization could be provided by the Earth's magnetic field, and there are people who do this, and then your Boltzmann polarization is going to be 10 to the, a part in 10 to the 11, or a part in 10 to the 12, if I got that right in my head, which is really small. So, so if we want to speak broadly about low field MRI, that's a field that we're still very active in. I would say that, that you know, your SNR is a function of field strength, as we talked about, is a very fast function. And then if you, pl so if you plot that, it looks like this. And then if you plot maybe cost or safety, you know, it, 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 it looks the other way, it looks like this. And so you might be able to like find an optimal place where if you were going to build a machine to do low field MRI, that hits all of those points. Um, but you still need a magnetic field, at least in the approach that I described here. Um, yeah, uh, there, there are some interesting things we could talk about, about pre-polarized MRI that people have tried doing, where you, you produce a Boltzmann polarization quite large, and then you turn off the magnetic field, use the Earth's magnetic field, very uniform, to do your spin precession, but then you're, and then use something like a squid uh, or, or optical magnetometer typically rubidium optical magnetometer to do, to do the detection. There are reasons uh, why those things are relatively inefficient in terms of the data rate, but I'm very active in some of that work, so we can talk about that. All right, let's thank our speaker again. <clears throat>